with us. Also want to take the time to say thank you to our veterans. Uh, we have several in this congregation. We appreciate you every day, but uh, as this weekend we have uh, honored through national celebra celebrations, we, uh, we want to say a special thank you to you as well for what you've done uh, for your country and to allow us to have the ability to do what we do here today, to preach the truth with minimal persecution. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in our lesson uh, and, uh, and parallel that with some of the lessons that we studied this morning in our Bible class. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, we read from the inspired spiritual veteran Paul. And here he encourages and implores and uh, makes a statement that can help us in our daily lives physically and spiritually uh, to help us to do what we need to do in order to get to heaven. He begins in chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I might win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, be made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This morning we want to look at this idea of pressing toward the mark. Pressing toward the mark. Paul had set for himself a lofty goal. We know this high goal of the high calling of God is eternal life. The spiritual life that we uh, attain here is a blessing, isn't it? It is a blessing to be in Christ and to have the opportunity for our sins to be forgiven, to enjoy the fellowship of those who are like-minded. And uh, Paul had apprehended that point but he said, I've not apprehended the eternal life. I haven't apprehended, I haven't gained what's awaiting me. And so there were certain things that he had gained. There were certain things he had apprehended. But he said, I have not apprehended. I have not reached my final goal, in other words. Yes, I have gotten to this point and I've gotten to that point, but I've not reached my final mark. And he called it his prize, didn't he? He called it his prize. You know, we set goals in this life, and it's good to set goals. We, we need to set goals that are reasonable. We need to set goals that are uh, available to us, things that we can achieve. You don't want to set goals for yourselves that are impossible to achieve. A, a goal that is impossible to achieve will, will cause you to be uh, frustrated at times. It may even cause you to stop pressing toward that goal, right? So Paul had set forth goals and he apprehended them one at a time and he achieved them one at a time, but he said, I'm not done. When he reached one point in his life, he said, I've got to move on. 
I've not yet apprehended. I've not uh, got to that final mark. And so he says, no matter where I am in my life, I continue to press toward that mark, the mark of the prize for the, hall, uh, the, the high calling of God. Every righteous soul should have this goal of heaven. But obtaining this eternal abode requires certain accomplishment of little goals on the way. It's not the temporal sort of goals that perhaps the, the people in the world consider to be uh, apprehendable, but it's spiritual benefits that we seek. And those spiritual benefits we know come from being in Christ. And Paul points that out here even in this text. That being in Christ, that the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God which is in faith, that's where the benefits of this life come. The spiritual benefits. The Bible tells us that eternal life is available. That God has offered it. That the means of uh, eternal life has been made possible. So we know that it is a possible goal. It is a reachable goal. It indeed has been promised to those who would be faithful to God. And so we set our goal high. to pri The prize to be high, but we recognize that there are, there are other goals as Christians that we must set before us that we may apprehend on the way, just as Paul did. We recognize that through Christ we have strength. We have the strength of God's Word. We have the strength of God's promise. Philippians 4 verse 17, with all these things, we know that we can accomplish these things. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We don't receive spiritual strengthening in a miraculous sense, but God has provided us the means for spiritual strength, His Word, fellowship with other Christians, other Christians who are older than we are, who are younger than we are, who are more mature than we are, who can help us along the path, who've seen things that we haven't seen. And we can receive strength from all of those things. And one of the things we can receive strength from is examples like Paul, recognizing how he apprehended yet continued to go towards the high calling of God, that high, that most high mark, that most high goal. And so we see ourselves in this life seeking to press toward this high mark, this, this high lofty goal. But we want to recognize that there are other goals that we must accomplish on the way. And these are objects that we seek to achieve. And they, uh, they require effort, don't they? You don't get anything if you do nothing. Goals, if you set them, require effort. If you set goals and don't do anything to achieve them, well, you'll, you won't achieve them. That's your, uh, if your goal is to not achieve, then you've already achieved. But Paul sets forth a way in which he lived his life that we can follow as an example as we apprehend certain goals and attain unto certain goals. But we need to recognize that we're not there yet. Right? Our, our ultimate goal is heaven. Our ultimate goal is that eternal prize of being with God in heaven for eternity. And so we want to look at some things here that we see in this text and throughout the scripture about goals and about the ultimate goal of getting to heaven. And when we look at these aspects of goal keeping, they're aspects that can help us in all of our goals, whether they be physical or spiritual. These are aspects that can help us in our life uh, no matter what we're doing. These are principles that are strong and sure. First, we note that in order to attain the goal of spiritual strength and spiritual maturity, Paul said he had to get rid of some things, didn't he? He said he had to get rid of some things. He said that in his previous life, if you will, his life bef that he, before he crucified it and put to death and was baptized and raised to walk in newness of life, he was a Jew, right? And he says uh, of the Jewish lineage of the flesh, and that when it speaks of the flesh, it's talking about the Mosaic law. He says, of the flesh, I know about living in the flesh. I know about living under that fleshly law, that physical law. And he said, I was circumcised the eighth day, verse 5. I was of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. 
In other words, uh, when, if it was anything to do with the Hebrew law, I did it and knew it. He says, uh, as touching the law of Pharisee, in other words, he said, when it came to the law, I may have been a little too strict. I may have been a little more on the side of uh, practicing the Pharisaical way in which, I, which Jesus reprimanded later as uh, saying and doing not. But Paul was always a doer. <laughs> and so uh, Paul was going uh, perhaps even beyond what he ought to, but his, his goal was to do what was right. Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. Why? Because he thought that was what was right. Under the Hebrew law and under the uh, pharisaical mindset, he thought here is an attack against my God. The God of Abraham and Jacob and, 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 uh, and Israel. And he said this, this is a false doctrine that's come up against my doctrine. But then he came to the knowledge of truth, didn't he? He came to a knowledge of the truth and he realized that he himself had been antichrist. That he himself had been an enemy to the God he wanted to serve. So what did he do? He changed, didn't he? He said, that life I had attained, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was, a, I, was it pertaining to the law? I was, I was fair sick. You might say that Paul had apprehended. He had attained. He was, a, he was pretty high up in Jewish system. But then he recognized that no matter how far he got in that particular system, he was separated from God. And so what does he say he does? He says, I counted that gain to be loss. In other words, the farther I go in this direction, the farther away I get from God. And that's a loss. That's a loss. The Pharisees, the scribes, were accused of making men more children of hell than they were anything else because as they were teaching their false doctrine and converting to that false doctrine, they were actually leading people away from the truth. So Paul said, I count that as loss. The things that I gained in that physical fleshly world. Verse 8, he says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. So he gave it all up, right? He said, I have to change. I have to give up this old pathway. I have to give up this old life. Even if giving up that old life means giving up a lot of status in society, or maybe even the ability to provide wealth. There are a lot of people today who recognize that they need to change, but there's something in their way keeping them from doing it. There's something in their way that they, there's something in their past they don't want to leave behind. There's a gain. There's something they've apprehended that they're not interested in, in leaving. And that's tough. That's hard. But the example of Paul is that if I'm going to press toward that high mark, the goal of all goals of getting to heaven, the first thing I have to do is give up something. I have to give up that past life. I have to give up all those things. And as much as Paul gained, he considered it to be a loss because the more he gained in the opposite direction, the further away he got from God. The second thing we note here is that once he gave those things up and he attained salvation, okay, that is, he heard the gospel, he believed it, he repented of his past sins, and he became a Christian. He was immersed in water. He got rid of our old life. Those old past sins had been washed away. Acts 22 verse 16. He rose up out of that watery grave of baptism, a Christian, a new creature, to work for the Lord, right? He had given up all those old things and now he was a, a new person. In fact, his name changes from Saul to Paul and he becomes a preacher of the gospel, right? Preaching the truth. Preaching for Christ. And he has become a new person, a new creature in Christ. Saved from his past sin. He has attained a goal, hasn't he? He apprehended a particular goal. He's had his past sins washed away. But notice, that's not where he ends, is it? That's not where he ends. In verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. <laughs> to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. 
Now, I would say that it's probably not beneficial to preach the same exact thing every Sunday, okay? <laughs> and, and I'm sure you all would agree with me. But you know, there's a time when we need to hear something again. And it won't hurt us to hear it again. And the truth is, if we heard it next Sunday, it wouldn't hurt us, right? It wouldn't hurt us. You know, if you're traveling, sometimes we'd be traveling and, and maybe a sermon I presented and I go and I, I hear a sermon and it'd be very similar to the one I just preached last Sunday. I don't get up and leave. You know what I do? I try to learn something new. I try to gain knowledge. And I, I take advantage of that opportunity. And you know what? Paul said, I'm preaching. The, you know why Paul preached the same thing over and over again? Because God only gave him one thing to preach. There was only one message. There's only one message. You know, people don't want to hear about repentance. Guess what? God said we have to repent or we'll likewise perish. People say, well, we've heard enough about hearing the Word of God in order to have faith. Well, you know what? There's only one way you can receive faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. We, we don't want to hear about baptism all the time. It's, well, there's only one way to have your sins washed away. There's only one way to be added to the body of Christ. There's only one way to get into Christ. And that's where Paul said he apprehended that first goal, wasn't it? Through righteousness of faith. That is, he found out what was right with God and he acted upon it. He did it. So if we're going to attain goals, there's some things we have to get rid of. Some things serve as anchors to keep us from achieving or apprehending our goal, don't they? We have to get rid of them. Paul then says, not only do you have to get rid of something, there's some things you need to do over and over again. Goals are achieved by improving, improving what we've already accomplished. In other words. And Paul said, I've apprehended, but I continue to grow. I continue to stri I strive. And of course, he indeed did do that. And, and for us to achieve goals, we might say, well, we've already heard that. We've already done that. Well, if we want to achieve the most high goal, then we need to improve on what we know. We need to improve on uh, our strength. We need to improve on how uh, we live in this life. And that may be to do things over and over again. In Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, Verse 4, uh, the Hebrews writer says, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. So these are in individuals who have apprehended, right? They've apprehended at least one goal. Okay? They've been enlightened. They tasted the heavenly gift. They were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit obviously... Uh, ultimately brought about salvation through means of the Word of God, the Word that was preached. The Holy Spirit uh, revealed the mind of God to men. The men preached it, and the, pre the, men, uh, the people who obeyed the preaching were saved from their sins. And they've tasted of the good Word of God and the powers of the world to come. So these are individuals who have apprehended a particular goal, haven't they? But notice verse 6. If they shall fall away... if they shall fall away. So it's possible to have apprehended a goal and then lose the benefits of it as if you had never obtained it to, to begin with. Why then would Paul say that we need to improve on things that we already know? Improve on things we've already accomplished? Because if we're not working towards, and I think that's a key, I press toward the mark of the, or the prize of the high calling of God, then we're not pressing in the right direction, are we? We may be pressing backwards. If they shall fall away, then of course the Hebrews writer says, renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. It is possible to obtain the goal of being saved from past sin and then go back into it. And so if we're going to achieve the highest goal, 
then when we do obtain goals on that way, having our sins washed away, that's a good step towards the high calling of God, isn't it? The first step, if you will. Then we need to continue on that pathway to make sure that we do not fall away. Back in our text of Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul says, I count not myself to have apprehended. Even though he had apprehended certain goals. But he knew it wasn't over, didn't he? And then he says this, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. That's what we talked about just a moment ago. Getting rid of the things that were behind him. Those things that would uh, cause him to not obtain his goal. And reaching forth unto those things which are before me. Not going back, but looking ahead, pressing toward. And that's what he says in verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. Now notice verse 15. Let us, and so Paul's here making a conclusion. Based upon what I just said, based upon what Paul just preached, Paul says, based upon this information, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, and the word perfect here doesn't mean without sin, it means that we have had our sins washed away and that we're following the perfect way, which is referred to as the perfect law of liberty, the word of God. Be thus minded, that is keep this idea of obtaining goals and never looking back. And if, any, uh, if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. In other words, where we are, let's continue doing what we are doing. Don't look backwards. Continue doing what we know to be right. Continue to walk as we have been taught to walk. So if we're going to be goal-oriented, especially in our spiritual life, we have to, we have to forget those things that are behind us. We have to put that life, uh, that life that was separated from God behind us forsake it, and then begin anew. And then once we've begun anew, we need to improve upon what we already know. What a, we need to improve upon what we've already accomplished and not think we've already attained. That would be equivalent to the, the doctrine of once saved, always saved. For someone to say, well, I've already had my past sins washed away. I'm as saved as I'm ever going to get, and I'm never going to be lost. That's someone who says, I've attained, I've apprehended, I'm done. No more pressing, right? No more pressing. But we can't do that because we recognize that the Bible teaches that people can fall away. That they can lose the benefits of what they have apprehended. And they can fall away from that which they have attained. And Paul said, do not stop where you've attained. Walk by the same rule. Continue to do what's right. Then we recognize that in order for this to take place, we need courage, don't we? Goals require courage. If, uh, if every goal was easily accessible, then there would be no one not reaching a goal. <laughs> Some people don't reach their goal because they've set it too far away, too high, maybe not reasonable. Uh, they may not have the, uh, the physical abilities to obtain it. But sometimes uh, goals aren't achieved because people quit. And the m reason most people quit is because of fear. They're afraid. I quoted one football coach not too long ago. I might try to quote another one. I think it was... Um, well, I can't think of his, his first name is Jimmy. He was the coach of the football uh, Cowboys. Jimmy Johnson. I believe it was him. And he may have been quoting another coach. But he said to his team, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Fatigue <laughs> makes cowards of us all. In other words, if we get tired, then the smallest opponent can take advantage of us. Right? 
You know, I might be the biggest, I might be the strongest, but if I get if I'm afraid, if I'm afraid, if I'm tired and I don't feel I can go on or move on, then the smallest individual can move me out of the way. That can be applied to anything in our ways, right? When we take our eyes off of the goal, what are we doing? We're allowing something small to push us away from our goal. What, however small that thing may be. It may be something that we enjoy in this physical life that, that, has, uh, that keeps us from doing what we ought to be doing. Right? It could be some pet sin, if you will, that we just refuse to give up. So we have to have courage to overcome those things. We have to have courage and if, because cowardice will cause us to back away. And we don't need to be backing away. Paul said we need to press ahead. We need to press forward. And so if we're not courageous, if we're fearful, if we're not courageous, we're not going to be pressing forward. We're going to be weak. And the smallest of opponent can push us out of the way. We studied in our Bible class this morning uh, Paul, the great example, right, of someone with courage. In his first missionary journey, he went to these cities and he preached the gospel. And at some point in uh, the journey in that city, uh, Jews became angry and envious and he had to leave, fearing for his life. And then at one point we read that he was stoned, taken out of the city, thought to be dead. And we discussed quite a bit about how he got up and walked back into the city that stoned him. Now, some people might say, well, that was courageous, and others might say it was foolish, right? And it depends on what they're pressing for. What's their goal? Paul's goal was to go to heaven. And Paul's goal of going to heaven led him to getting up and going back into that city. That's why he went back into that city. <laughs> he, wanted to go back, he wanted to go to heaven. In Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1, this isn't the first place we're introduced to courage by no means, but it is very early on in history. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, obviously Joshua had served as an understudy to Moses who had um, helped Israel achieve, attain a goal, hadn't he? And he had showed courage in the midst of that. But now Joshua would be taking over and leading the rest of the way, leading through these battles and leading Israel into the promised land. And God tells him, verse 6, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Now the key for Joshua to have strength and courage is the fact that God said, I have already given it to them. Now the first time they went in 40 years ago, they didn't have that faith, did they? That's the reason they weren't able to walk in and, and attain that goal of the promised land because they didn't have the faith. They didn't truly believe that God had already given it to them. So what's our source of strength, our source of courage? It's God's promises, isn't it? When God promises a thing, we know it to be true. And so God said, be strong and be courageous. No matter what happens, no matter what's said, I have given you this land. Only be thou strong, verse 7. So he tells him again. Because Joshua needed to, this was going to be a, a difficult fight, wasn't it? Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn thee from it, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest pr prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So Joshua's source of strength was God promised it. 
God had given it, and then God said, you have me on your side, right? And how was God on their side? He said, you take the book with my words in it, and you meditate on it day and night, and you don't turn from it to the left, and you don't turn to it from the right. You do exactly what I say, and you'll prosper. Now that applies to us today. We're not under the old law, but we can take God's word with us. And when we're afraid, we can open it up. When we're not so sure what we ought to be doing, we can open it up. And we can remind ourselves that God said, no matter what happens in your way that might cause you to fear, open up my word. Read about my promises. Even if it comes to the point of death, right? Revelation 2 verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death. That means even if you're going to be put to death, don't turn from me. Why? And why would anybody say that? Because on the other side, Stephen would tell us, right? I didn't turn from God. Where's Stephen? He passed over, didn't he? He, he pressed toward the mark and he received it. He didn't give in. And so, during fearful times, we look to God so that we don't fear so that we can achieve our goals. We also need to recognize that in our attempts to reach our goals and pressing toward the most high goal of heaven, that we need to help others along the way. In fact, we can't achieve our goal of heaven if we don't help others along the way. In Jude, verse 16, Jude reminds the brethren that there are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. That is, they don't obey the Word of God that was revealed by the Holy Spirit. But ye, beloved, build up yourselves on your most high holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That is, keep pressing toward the mark. But notice verse 22, okay? So verse 21, he says, Keep yourselves, that's our number one priority, to press toward the mark. Keep yourselves looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. But notice verse 22, And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. In order for us to achieve our goal, we have to help others along the way, don't we? In fact, that was the great commission that Jesus left behind for his disciples, right? This, this, this great commission made you a disciple. You heard the word, you believed it, you repented of your past sins, you confessed the name of Christ, you were baptized in water to have your sins washed away, and then what did the great commission command? Go ye and teach all nations. Right? Go do the same. Continue the process. If we're going to achieve our goal, we have to at least make that goal available to others. We can't make people obey the gospel. But it is our objective. It is our responsibility to make sure that that is available to them. To preach the word to the lost. I need to help others come into a knowledge of the truth. Encourage them to obey the Christ so that they can attain that most high calling as well. And then lastly, as we achieve our goals, we need to recognize that when we do achieve anything, when we attain any little thing, and when we go from step to step towards our pressing towards that most high goal of heaven, that it wasn't something that we deserved that we're looking for 
We need to give God the glory for all of it. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, that is, by His authority. Not by my authority or other men's authority, but let God's will rule my life and direct me towards that most high goal, right? But then notice, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You know, we don't deserve the opportunity to receive this goal, our sin, put us in this position in the first place separated from God but God loved us so much that he made a way by which we can be reconciled back to him and that plan required the blood of a sinless lamb his only begotten son John 3 verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's how much God loved us. And He gave us a way by which we could have our sins washed away. That plan has been presented through hearing the Word, through believing the Word, accepting that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, making that great confession known, repenting of our past sins, and then being immersed in water to have those sins washed away. God adds those individuals to His church. Acts chapter 2, verse 47. They're saved from their past sins. And from that day on, we press toward the mark. We press toward the goal. And in order to press towards that most high goal, we have to put those things in our past life behind us, put those things behind us, forget those things, put on Christ, continue to grow in Christ, to continue to realize we need to improve upon our faith and our, our goals as we continue that life. Remember that we have to help others in order for us to obtain our goal and that every goal that we achieve and every goal we seek spiritually is because of God. Give God the glory always. We can do it. If we couldn't do it, God wouldn't have commanded us to do it. And so you have been called to press toward the mark this morning. You have been encouraged to obey the gospel and if you have not yet obeyed the gospel, the invitation is open to you. If you'd like to uh, come forward, you can. If you have already obeyed those initial acts but have something else in your life that you'd like uh, for us to help you with, we'll be more than glad to do so. If you have something private in your life, take care of it privately. Make sure you're right with God by comparing your life with what God says in His Word as we stand and sing.